Well, hey there, everybody. Brian Goulet here of GouletPens.com. It is episode number 220 of Goulet Q&A. Just keep on rolling with these things every week. I absolutely love it. Um, got uh, six questions here for you this week. I'm trying to keep it a little bit lower key on the questions. I don't know why. It seems that even if I pick fewer questions, I still tend to go longer than I planned. But you know, I just kind of get in the zone and what can you say? Um, really appreciate y'all coming back here every week. Um, if you have not subscribed already, I want to encourage you to do so. It's cool. It helps us out because YouTube likes it when that happens and then it shows our video to more people and all that kind of stuff. So if you haven't done that yet, it's super cool to do that. And if you'd like to get notifications too, you can turn those on uh, and then you can you know, find out when we're publishing stuff. So if you haven't done that yet, just wanna encourage you to do that. Um, let's see here, what's happened in the last week? Um, it's been getting some good solid family time. You know, my kids are just at that age. They're six and a half, eight and a half. They're still really adorable, still really precious, but yet they're doing some interesting things. They have their own thoughts and opinions and they're discovering things on their own. We've done some like science experiments. We mixed like baking soda and vinegar and made like a volcano thing. We've been making some slime with like watered down clear glue and saline solution and mixing in glitter and food coloring and all that kind of stuff and just making some cool fun stuff. It's been just wild because my kids are old enough to understand like some more advanced concepts, but at the same time, things are so new and fresh to them. It's just really cool to see things through their eyes. Any of you who have, you know, younger siblings or nieces and nephews or your own kids, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Or if you just work with kids in general, they just see things through such fresh eyes and it just, you know, helps an old soul like me to, to stay young. Um, but anyway, so that's been really cool. Penwise, you know, we launched Diplomat within the last week and that's been really cool. You know, seeing this brand, which I knew was kind of a sleeper, seeing it kind of come to life and seeing how it's been received. The arrow, especially the orange one here, has been kind of the runaway, uh, which has been awesome. And then the Magnum as well, which I don't have with me, but uh, the Magnum uh, has been uh, the smashing success as well. In fact, we're out of a lot of those, but we're getting restocked. Um, so that's pretty cool. And uh, so that's been neat to see uh, that picking up some speed. Some other things that we are gonna get restocked on, I just found out today, as of Wednesday anyway, when I'm recording this, um, we're hopefully gonna get restocked on some Lamy 2000s here, uh, maybe next week. So that could be really cool, like the fine nibs, like some of the ones that we haven't had in a while. So that's really cool. Um, so that's, you know, encouraging to see. Um, they're really determined to kind of uh, help improve some of the stocking and stuff. Um, I do want to apologize because last week I talked about the Clairefontaine Aquarelle notebooks. Did not realize at the time that I recorded it on Wednesday that we would be sold out by the time the video launched on Friday. That was kind of my bad. But we had a bunch of the notebooks and I didn't think they would all sell out that quickly. Um, but I don't know, I guess it was really cool. So we bought them, they were already made. They're kind of like being discontinued. We are looking into kind of placing a larger special order. It's gonna take several months to get it in, but um, if you are interested and you're like freaking out because you loved that notebook, but you couldn't get it, don't fret too much because I think we're gonna to try to get more back, but it's gonna take a little while. So anyway, do wanna apologize about that. I never wanna to try to show you guys things that you then can't get right away. That's really frustrating. Um, we're also getting some more Jinhao Shark Pen colors, which I think we'll have by Friday. So that's really exciting, expanding the color line. We ordered those like almost immediately after we launched the original batch that we got of five colors. We're getting basically the rest of the colors that we're able to get um, and then restocking the dragon pen as well, this epic dragon pen. We did try to actually order a different color dragon, expand the dragon line, but they don't make it anymore and all this kind of stuff. So we're going back and forth. There's language barriers there. We're trying to work it out, maybe expand the dragons. I don't know, we're gonna see, but if you're interested in that, we did get a, a pretty good stock of those dragons. Um, we also launched the Homo Sapiens Evolution. Uh, pretty interesting pen. I did write all of those in the nib nook and the nibs are really good. It's similar, similar nib to um, the tubular chromium nib if you've ever used that on like the Millennium Arc or any of the Opera Metal or anything like that. Um, that nib is not on a ton of pens, uh, but uh, it's pretty interesting and it's got this kind of skeleton look and the pen itself is actually it's higher quality than I was thinking it would be. I was thinking like, oh gosh, you know, the original kind of lava Homo sapiens is so just iconic and it's just, I carry that with me daily and I love it. Um, so I was thinking like, oh gosh, are they gonna try and do a variant on it? You know, cause like we had the Homo sapiens um, elegance, which was all resin and it just didn't feel the same. You know what I mean? Uh, but this one, sturdiness is there. The weight is there, still got the, the volcanic body to it, which got some interesting things going on in the cap and whatnot. The nib writes really well. It's not as soft and stuff as a palladium nib, you know, so it's like, 
it's yet to be seen how it's going to be received, but uh, even still, I think it's it's worth a thoughtful consideration if you're really kind of a hardcore, um, you know, uh, Visconti fan. I think it's worth worth a shake. Um, we also got restocked on the Stipula Toco Ferro, which we've not had for a little while. It's our final shipment. We're not going to have any more. It's a limited pen at 351 or something like that. We got our last batch of it, and then it's going to be gone. So if you like that one, save up your pennies. Um, I don't think it's going to be gone like in hours or days, but, um, you know, it's always hard to tell with this kind of stuff. Um, and then, you know, kind of last thing um, is that uh, we have the DC Pen Show this weekend. By the time this video launches, um, I'll be close to actually being at the show. So I've got a follow-up appointment with my nutritionist. I've been on this diet, exercise kind of routine, regimen thing, very specialized, very, you know, if you followed me on Instagram, I posted all this stuff and how I've been cooking and all that. Um, so I, I have my next follow-up on Friday. By the time this publishes, I'll probably have had it already. Um, so I get to see how things are going. You know, it's been hard. It's, I've been basically on this regimen since October of last year, some variant of it, and I've been getting checked up and trying to straighten stuff out with my body. Got some insulin issues, runs throughout my family. I'm trying to work through that stuff kind of naturally, so it takes a long time doing that without medication and stuff like that. Um, making some progress. Other things aren't moving along as fast as I thought. You know, it's kind of a bumpy road, just like you know, most health related things can be. Um, but I've been getting a lot of support, a lot of encouragement about that, um, just in case you're kind of curious. So I've got that going on on Friday and then, uh, and then I'll be heading over to the DC show. So Rachel and I will be there. Um, we're gonna be staying up in the area for uh, basically the entirety of the show. Um, so we're gonna be doing some, you know, vendor relationship things, having some dinners and stuff with people that we don't normally get to see all that often. Um, and also just, we're not gonna work a booth or anything, but we're basically just gonna be at the show, in the action, checking things out. We got you know several different tables of people that we want to stop by. I want to check out some different brands and things that um, you know are, are things that you guys have been asking us for if they happen to be at the show. So that'd be kind of fun. And then also um, you know just kind of there to meet you all because anybody happens to be there. So um, we are hosting an actual meetup, very informal, very casual. Basically, it's, you know, so that people don't have to freak out if they really want to meet me or Rachel or Drew will be there too. And we got some other members of our team that are going to be there. If you really want to meet us and hang out at some point, um, we're going to be in the bar, basically, that's like right next to the main lobby in the hotel um, at the uh, Marriott Fairfield. Um, where the show is, we're going to be basically in kind of in front of the bar, somewhere around the bar um, at 3 o'clock p.m. on Saturday. So we'll just be there from like three to four ish, depending on how many people show up and who knows. Um, but uh, we'll be around like the whole weekend basically, but we'll make it a point to be at that location at that time. So that if you're like dying to share something or, or meet us or whatever it is, it feels so weird for me to be like, come and meet me. Cause I, I'm, I'm such like a normal dude. Like I really don't think of myself as anybody that's that special to meet, but I get it, you know? So like we're doing that. And we'll be there and i would love to meet you if you're going to be at the show um last year it was the whole show was really crazy for me because each year i've been going this will be the 10th year that i've gone to the dc pen show in a row and so every year gets a little and a little crazier for me not only because i think the show itself has kind of gotten busier uh, but also because obviously doing this thing for close to 10 years now um, obviously kind of become more and more known my face is out there a lot in these videos so I get recognized a lot for doing the videos so when I go to the show it's it's just wild because I'm just a normal dude like 99.5 percent of my life but in that room for that weekend it gets a little crazy for me so and it's kind of fun anyway so I'll be on Instagram brian.goulet uh, if you want to follow me on Instagram, I'll be doing Instagram stories and stuff kind of throughout the weekend. Should be a lot of fun. You get to hang out with some cool pen folk. Just, you know, it's my people. So um, that'll be fun. So questions for this week. Let's start off with some pen writing questions. First one is from Young Chivalrous on Instagram. Which brand offers the softest gold nib? Lamy, Pilot, Aurora, Edison, Platinum, PTL 5000A, etc. Um, yeah, I mean, you named some pretty good ones here, Young Chivalrous. Um, so Pilot Falcon, you know, anything that is listed as soft, I think is going to have to kind of take the cake as far as having a soft nib or anything flexible. I'm thinking like the Omos extra flexible and, you know, anything, of course, that's been modified. But I'm trying to stick more to like 
um, the kind of the factory stock nibs, things that you could you know easily kind of buy and find. Um, so the Pilot Falcon with the soft nib, that one's kind of like right in there. That it's gonna be really soft. Um, so that one has to kind of go up there. You know, the Justice 95, Pilot Justice 95 could go in there too um, because it's got kind of an adjustable nib. It's a little bit of its own category, but it's about, it's about a softness of the Pilot Falcon. You get good line variation with that. Um, Paniter actually has a really soft nib too. Um, you know, very, very heavy spring action to it. You can get a little line variation with that. Um, the Pelican M1000. Not a pen that I regularly stock here, um, but that nib is phenomenal and is really, really soft. Um, there are other nibs like the M800. You know, they get kind of stiffer uh, slightly in, the, in their nibs as they get smaller. So like the M800, 600, 400, etc. Um, but uh, the M1000 in particular, the largest one, really, really soft. Um, another pilot, the E95S, is actually surprisingly soft. They don't advertise it as soft or anything like that. It's a 14 karat nib. You ne wouldn't necessarily know, looking at that pen, how soft that nib actually is, but you can get a decent amount of spring to it, especially I have the extra fine one, and uh, it's, it's, it's pretty soft. That's really cool. Um, Edison, you mentioned Edison, so um, that, that's, they've used Yovo nibs, so you could kind of lump it in with, with most of the Yovo, like number six especially size, gold nibs. Those are really quite soft, quite springy, very wet nibs. Um, and so they, not quite as soft as like the Pilot soft nibs, but, but kind of up there with the best of them. Um, Visconti, I have to throw a shout out to them in here. Technically, their nibs are not gold, they're palladium, but their palladium nibs are the equivalent of some of the softer, you know, gold nibs out there. Some of the softer, like 18 karat nibs and um, not quite Pilot Falcon. That kind of sets the standard, but uh, that one goes up there too. Um, Lamy, Lamy's gold nibs are very, very smooth, not quite as you know, lot much line variation. They're smaller nibs, but they do feel really soft. They've got some spring to them. They are super smooth. So I'm gonna throw them in the mix too. Not the Lamy 2000, that nib is really pretty stiff. But the, the 14 karat like you would have on the Emporium or the, um, you know, some of the studios and CP1s and some of the some of the ones that have those gold nibs, um, they would be up there. You know, you mentioned Aurora, you threw them in here. I don't think that Aurora's nibs are really all that soft. They're kind of on the stiffer end, just like Platinum, their normal kind of 14 karat nibs are really pretty stiff and that's kind of like the floor for me is like platinum has some of the stiffest gold nibs that are out there with the exception of the ptl 5000a because you kind of threw that one in there um, that that nib is actually pretty soft you can actually get some line variation with that one and it's the cheapest uh, gold nib pen that we offer so that's uh, kind of interesting too um, but yeah so um, you know pile or sorry platinum does have some soft nibs you know like we have the kumpu which is not going to be around for much longer if we even still have it by the time this video publishes. Um, that one has a soft medium. Uh, their soft nibs really kind of end up being a little bit more like the non-soft version of Pilot nibs. Um, so they're soft, but they're not nearly as like soft and flexy as say Pilot's soft nibs are. So, you know, th there's a couple different grades there, um, but in general, their, their normal like 3776 non-soft nib is, is really pretty stiff. So there you go, there's, there's a bunch of pens that I could kind of throw in the mix, but those are some of the ones that were kind of top of mind for me, kind of going off where you led me, and then some of the ones that I thought were, were most notable. Cool, all good nibs though. All right, Robert M on YouTube asked, any advice on how to find more, as Rachel said, rocker clip pens? I don't know what the official term is, but I have a pocket on my bag made of a thicker leather than usual, and would like to be able to use more of that kind. Okay, so um, I think the context of what Rachel was talking about um, and what you referenced is when we did our Right Now earlier this week on Diplomat, and she had the excellence. Um, so the the <laughs> there's three different versions of the Diplomat Excellence. Um, and the one that she was referencing is kind of like the, the second version, um, which has is, is very similar. It's got the snap cap. Um, I have an Excellence that's 
that's not the version that Rachel was talking about. So I can't, if I show it, it doesn't really show you much. Um, but if you look at the right now, you can see what it is. But basically, a rocker clip is something similar to what uh, Conklin has on some of their pens. So basically, it's, it's a spring clip that has kind of an extension beyond the clip that if you push on the back of it, it'll open up the clip. Does that make sense? Like, if, I don't know how well you can see that, but if I spring it, then you can see that it kind of opens it up and allows you to fit it over something that's pretty wide. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be a rocker clip like this to accomplish what it is that you're talking about doing. If you've got thick clothing or you've got, you know, a messenger bag or something, jeans or something that you want to put it in, of course, you always want to be intentional if you're putting it in like thick clothing, just making sure that you know, you don't have it like in your pocket with your keys, if it's a pen that could be easily scratched, something like that. Anyway, bit of a tangent, but, but relevant. Um, the nice thing about having a rocker clip specifically is it makes it so that you can, in one action, kind of grab it, open it up, clip it in, and then it's kind of done. As opposed to a pen that has, say, a spring clip, you know, like the Lamy 2000, you know, actually that's got a rocker clip too, now that I think about it. It doesn't have like an overhang, but that one's got a spring clip. I didn't even put that in my notes, but it has it. It's one of my favorite pens too, so you would think. So if you push on the back of the Lamy 2000, you can get kind of that spring action as well. So um, not quite as much room as say the Conklin here or maybe even the Diplomat, um, but it can accomplish sort of the same thing where it just clips right on there. It's really handy, especially with some clips because some of them don't have um, you know, the absolute smoothest, easiest kind of opening. So it doesn't necessarily, if you didn't have the rocker, I mean, the Lamy 2000 is not too bad. That one just kind of slides right on there. But some of them, if the, if the, you know, like the Conklin, for example, over thick clothing, it can be hard to kind of get it in there on the first try, but the rocker clip allows you just kind of boom, right in there. Other pens, um, I would classify more as having spring clips not necessarily a rocker clip. So a rocker clip would really be one that you could like pinch the back of it and open it up like that. And I, you know, I didn't comb through like every pen that I have. I did look through the website and I was trying to remember like which has a rocker clip and which doesn't because truth be told, we don't have like a breakdown on our website of rocker clip versus not. It's really difficult for us based on all of the different dynamics and technical specs of what we have to think of like what facets matter and how you shop and stuff like that. This is one that kind of got me scratching my head a little bit thinking, is this an important enough feature for everybody that it would be first off clear what it is and then be helpful to have it as a facet. So I thought I would at least talk about it in Q and A and get your, your wheels kind of turning and see if there was something there and us maybe diving into that a little bit deeper. But really the Conklin pens, um, not all of them, but most of the pens, with the exception of the Duragraph, have that rocker clip. The Excellence, Diplomat Excellence, has that rocker clip. The Lamy 2000 has that rocker clip. Other than that, maybe the CP1, I don't remember. Um, but that was kind of the ones that I could remember. Maybe the Lamy Nex, I couldn't remember that one either. Most of the other ones that were coming to my mind were ones that have a spring clip not necessarily a rocker clip. So an example of a pen that has a spring clip would be one like the Peniter Le Grande Beleza. So that one, it has a, you know, basically has the ability to open up really wide and it has a spring that closes it as opposed to, you know, a pen like the um, Diplomat Arrow where it's just literally, you know, tension that keeps it in place and it doesn't have any spring that, um, you know, it kind of cantilevers on the back of it, um, you know, as opposed to like the Legrande Beleza. It's, it's usually an easier motion to open that up. Spring clips usually open wider. So pens like that. Um, so ones that have spring clips, Faber-Castell has spring clips on most, if not all of their pens. Um, Lamy's, basically all the Lamy's with the exception of the Safari All-Star um, and the Studio, the Vista, you know, with the exception of those, you know, the CP1, the Lamy 2000 here, you know, they're all gonna have springs built in. Um, the Peniter pens, the Avatar, the Legrande Beleza, uh, and then Visconti, a lot of their pens, you know, like the Homo Sapiens. 
And that one, um, it would be kind of nice if it had a spring clip and maybe some of like some of the pens, I can't remember all of them, but um, they almost all of them have this bridge clip. Um, so they're spring loaded, pretty easy to pull back. Um, but because they, they basically have like no, no lip under there, you really can't just slide it onto any clothing. You have to pretty much pinch it and get it on there. So you can still do the one-handed close. You can still do that with some of the pens, just kind of pulling up on the clip and then sliding it into your you know clothing or whatever. Um, but the spring clips to me are a little bit easier. Not the only factor to what will fit onto wide clothing, um, but it usually helps quite a bit in that way. So hopefully that helps out at least a little bit. If we can think of a better way to display it and help you shop, obviously that's what we're here for and that's what we're trying to do. So maybe if you guys have any strong feelings about it one way or another, if you're like, oh my gosh, this would help so much on the website, you guys should really think about this. You know, maybe we can look to create a more intentional piece of content around this instead of just a random question in the middle of the episode 220 of Q&A. Uh, or maybe we can look to build it into a feature on the site. I don't know. I'll let you all help me determine if that's um, something worth our time doing because, you know, we got no shortage of things to do. So if that's something that's interesting, let me know. All right. Business question. Let's talk about this from Brian R. on Facebook. How do you reach out to pen manufacturers with critiques and suggestions? or to ink producers? Okay, this is, um, you know, a, a bit of a broad question, but a very valid one, you know, because we're dealing with a lot of products. Sometimes we're dealing with, you know, your concerns, questions, requests, quality issues, you know, all kinds of random things. And I tell you, every single day, we get hit with random things across random uh, products, manufacturers, vendors, whatever you want to call it. Um, so this is one of those things where I'll, I'll speak about it somewhat in principle, and then somewhat, you know, kind of tactical as well. In principle, the thing I will say is part of what I view our role is in serving you as a customer and serving our manufacturer or the distributor um, is to provide education, to provide service, and really to communicate and be a liaison um, between you all as the ones who are kind of the end user of these, you know, magical products. Um, and the people who are manufacturing them. So um, in an ideal world, you would be able to communicate directly with the manufacturer and everything would be very clear and simple. That is not always the case. Sometimes you have, excuse me, language barriers. Sometimes you have technical barriers. You just don't understand the terminology and can't speak the same language uh, in that way. Sometimes it can just be a matter of the manufacturer is very small and they just can't handle all of the feedback. They need it kind of gathered up and delivered in a constructive way. So there's a lot of different ways that that can look depending on a lot of different factors. But in principle, the idea that we have is we look to build trust and we look to build our own competence in terms of our technical ability, our technical understanding, our understanding of your needs as a customer, our understanding of their needs as a manufacturer, and then trying to communicate and create a win-win scenario for everybody involved. You know, sometimes there are situations where a manufacturer has to do something a certain way. It could be a regulation thing. It could be, you know, just a physical limitations or a manufacturing capacity or skill or a design issue. Um, and it just has to be the way that it is. And it's our job to communicate that and, and provide you all with that feedback. Other times it could be coming the opposite direction. You all are seeing something, the manufacturer maybe didn't design it that way or they're not having that issue themselves. Any of you who are like coders or deal with IT related things, you know, it's like trying to replicate, you know, the issue. You always know, like if you're developing something, you test it in your own environment, but then once it goes out there, somebody on a certain operating system with a certain browser might have an issue that you just hadn't foreseen. The same thing can kind of happen with a manufacturer making a physical product. By the time it gets to a certain location or somebody uses it in a certain way, it, they just didn't foresee that happening. So, you know, for us, there's a huge amount of trust that has to be built there, both with you all as customers and with our manufacturers as manufacturers. So that's, that's a huge part of the role that we look to play. So with that said, you know, 
I believe in the speed of trust. The stronger you have trust, the more competent you are in being able to communicate both ways, the more efficient your communication can be, the less you have to kind of walk on eggshells, the clearer you can be, the more frank you can be, and the more you can really kind of drive home your point of what needs to happen. You know, the stronger the trust relationship is with a given manufacturer, the more direct we can be about the feedback and the more we can kind of push them to really give you what you all need as customers. So um, that is kind of um, an ideal scenario, not like trying to be like, you know, a bully and get our own way or any anything by that measure. But, you know, sometimes, <laughs> and I'm sure you all can relate to some of this, especially if you've ever worked in retail, um, you know, sometimes you can have very passionate feedback with completely opposing views about what should be done. So sometimes it's, it's difficult for us to kind of decipher what feedback is most meaningful and would actually be the most beneficial, um, you know, and, uh, and so we, we try to serve that up as we can uh, to, our, to our manufacturers. Um, but basically what we try to do is we try to study up, really understand what it is that we're talking about, understand what it is that needs to happen as an end result, and kind of like ideologically or in principle, you know, there's a really good book called QBQ uh, by John G. Miller. Um, and the whole idea behind that is really about personal accountability. And kind of what that looks like for us here at Goulet is that we don't, we don't like to just take a complaint and drop it and leave it there and say, well, this nib is messed up and so you guys just need to fix it and then leave it at that. We always try to say, okay, we're getting some complaints about these nibs. Let's try and get as clear a picture. We'll have some reporting. We're getting such a percentage of problems with these nibs. Here's the overall thing. We've inspected a variety of these nibs. Here's how many we looked at. This is the common issue that we see. This is what we think is causing it. And we recommend that if you all can address this, 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 and this, then we will not have this issue anymore or it'll be significantly less. So that's what we look to do and it's basically all behind the scenes. That's what we look to do for our manufacturer and we find that by providing that level of information to them, it's like the most helpful thing and it just way, way cuts down on the confusion that or in the miscommunication that could happen between manufacturer and kind of the end user. Because if you're talking about, you know, manufacturer could be in Italy or Germany or Japan or whatever, and by the time all the channels of communication go through, it could be like a game of telephone where things get confused. So we try to be as absolutely clear as possible. Um, and then always make suggestions, not just complain. Um, that's kind of a, a philosophical principle that we have here at Goulet is, is always trying to, to serve up a suggestion whenever there is any type of critical feedback or complaint that goes with it. So. You know, with smaller manufacturers, you know, if we're dealing with Edison pens or something who we dealt with for a number of years and, um, you know, we know they're, they're not that big, usually the communication can be pretty direct, can be pretty quick. If we're giving feedback to Pilot or Lamy or, you know, global companies that are, that are, you know, dealing with thousands or maybe even tens of thousands of retailers across the country, it can be very difficult across the world. Uh, it can be difficult to communicate that as clearly as say a smaller manufacturer. So we really have to kind of um, take the approach, you know, uh, individually uh, as far as what the issue is and who it's going to and all that kind of stuff. So um, we're happy to do that though. There's always a lot to learn kind of in both directions and, um, and we just love doing that process and we try to, we try to uh, focus on, you know, it's just really one of the things that, that we're here to do. Um, so yeah, that's a little insights for you. I'm trying to give you some, some value add on that question. All right. I uh, actually have three sort of personal questions to, to, to round out the latter half of this Q&A here. Uh, the first one is from Ed D on Facebook. With all the pen shows, social media, and YouTube channels that are around, what community venue or forum do you think the pen community could benefit from having that we don't currently have? I thought this was a really interesting question because the landscape has changed a little bit since I've been looking at things in the last nine years or so. And I'm gonna take a sip of water while I uh, think about answering this question. Okay, um, it's true, there's a lot of different communities out there. You know, and me thinking back to kind of where everything was centralized back when I first got into fountain pens in 2009, it looks, it looks a little different than it does now. Um, if you think about in 2009, 
Um, Instagram had not yet been invented. <laughs> um, YouTube was around, uh, but it was uh, you had a 10 minute limit on video length that you could post on YouTube. Uh, and uh, it was just not, not as widely used as it is today, especially for kind of like business educational purposes uh, and product related things. Um, let's see here, Pinterest had not yet been invented, Snapchat had not yet been invented, Facebook looked very different, they didn't have Facebook business pages, advertising, I don't even know if it was a thing back then or it was in its infancy, so just businesses had not gotten onto there yet, um, and there were no like, you know, groups around you know, niche hobbies like this so much back then. You had message boards, you had forums, you know, the Fountain Pen Network was the leading forum at the time. Um, and you had a lot of bloggers who were doing things, not so much YouTubers and, and uh, things like that. Uh, and, and so social, Twitter was around, but like social media back then was not nearly as developed, especially for the pen community. Um, at the time, it was really, it was kind of like the Wild West a little bit. So there was some of that conversation going on, um, but everybody was kind of gathered around the Fountain Pen Network and then some other like blogs and kind of just going around. I remember blog readers were a thing. Like I used to use Net Newswire. Uh, and so I had like 50 different blogs that I was following. And so I would, it would automatically download all the blog articles into my blog reader every day. You know, Google Reader and things like that for any of you who uh, want to throw back. Google discontinued that and Net Newswire, I don't even know what happened to that. I've changed computers two times since then and never downloaded the program. So it's, you know, it's evolved and it's changed quite a bit over the time. So you know, these days, I think a lot of the pen community stuff, I mean, Fountain Pen Network is still there. It's still got kind of its own thing. There's also like a Fountain Pen Network Facebook group that's a private group. You know, we have Goulet Nation that we created kind of as a private group uh, on, on Facebook. So there's a lot of Facebook private groups. Um, message boards are not so much of a thing, but you have like Reddit has been invented since then. So Reddit uh, has become kind of a message board and, the, you know, the, our fountain pens on Reddit is, is, is alive and well. Um, so you end up with kind of like these larger kind of social communities where niche interests like that end up happening uh, around fountain pens, but it's more natively on a given platform than it is like there's an entire forum or an entire community that's created from scratch just on fountain pens. That seems to be a little more rare because I think you know, just people only have so much time. And so generally you're gonna be, if you're gonna be on Instagram, you wanna be following some fountain pen stuff, but you wanna be following some whatever, woodworking stuff like I do. Um, for any of you who are looking at my watch and are interested, I have to mention this at some point here because I know I'm gonna get asked about it, but this is my new watch that I just got yesterday by Original Grain. Not affiliated with them in any way, but uh, you know, American made watches and it's got like wood face and you know, components to it, which is pretty cool. So I love woodworking. I like watches. So having a watch with wood on it is pretty cool to me. So I follow some like woodworking stuff. So, you know, they, they got me on Instagram. I got, I caught an ad in my Instagram feed and they, they nabbed me. Um, so that's, uh, that happens. Um, they didn't nab me. I, I saw it and it was appealing and I clicked on it. I've been following them for a while anyway. So, uh, you know, it's just the kind of thing like, a lot of people now are involved more already in their social platforms because that's just kind of representative of the general parts of their life. It's less like, I'm gonna go onto this forum about Canon cameras because I shoot Canon. Uh, I'm gonna go onto this forum on whatever, fountain pens. I'm gonna go on this forum on parenting. You know, some of that might happen, but you know, really if I can capture a lot of that kind of in one place, in one feed on a social platform, that might help and then I can see, you know, kind of influencers or people that I might follow and respect and what are they linking to? Who are they pointing to kind of scattered about the internet? It's a little more curated now than it was back in the day. So it has evolved a little bit. I know I haven't answered any of your question yet. I've been talking just about history. Um, but all that to say, like, it's hard to say just like, where is the gap that there is to be filled? Because socially, uh, there's a lot of stuff out there. It's more about like kind of wrangling it all together. Um, you know, obviously there's things like YouTube channels and, and, you know, Facebook groups, you know, Instagram like hashtags and other things like that. Um, there's a couple of like needs that I think there could be met 
that maybe aren't like hitting the nail on the head in the pen community right now. And uh, you know, obviously if there was something that was such a gaping hole and it was easy to tackle, uh, I and my team would be inspired to try to do that, you know, um, so, you know, maybe I'm not like giving away secrets of anything we're working on it right now, but these are just kind of some things, right, ideas I'm rattling around um, idealistically that would be like, yeah, you know, something out there could be good. Or maybe if you know of something where you're like, oh, Brian, this is already happening. You just don't know what's going on, man. Uh, let me know in the comments. Let my team know in the comments and we can kind of have that on our radar. But anyway, here's kind of top of mind some of the things, um, you know, I'm thinking about um, people that are into pens meeting up locally right like there's some pen shows that happen throughout the country certainly there's way way more organization that could happen around pen shows online you know there's more meetups there's more stuff like that that could happen around the pen shows themselves i'll just leave it at that the people that are usually organizing the pen shows are completely disconnected from how to capitalize on social media to make that happen so uh, I am not the solution for that, but I recognize that as a major opportunity to help make pen shows more interesting. Um, but anyway, even aside from like formal organized pen shows, just opportunities for local people who are into pens to meet up. I know it kind of like organically grassroots will spring up here and there. And some of that happens through like Facebook groups and some of that happens um, just from people that happen to know each other through pen shows or happen to know each other locally in the area. They kind of organized through an email thing or whatever, but you know, certainly there's, there's um, opportunities for more people in local areas to get together and have kind of pen meetups. Um, so that's, I'll just kind of leave that hanging out there. I know, you know, even in our, our local area in Richmond here through Goulet Nation, that has been something that's sprung up and there's been one or two meetings so far that have happened there. So, but there's no like one kind of central place where that happens. It's very organic. It certainly could be an opportunity for, for something more organized. Um, there's no single great like pen trading or reselling platform. You know, one of the great things about fountain pens is they last a really long time. And you know, people that are interested in pens, you try a bunch and sometimes you hang on to pens that you don't really use anymore. You maybe want to trade them or you want to sell them and then kind of put that towards another pen that's maybe to your liking. You know, there's, there's some stuff, like there's some hashtags on Instagram, there's, um, you know, like a reselling area on Fountain Pen Network and uh, Reddit and e there's eBay and stuff like that. But, you know, and, and I get asked, we get asked about this a lot here at Goulet is like, why don't you guys have like a trading post of sorts like that? Part of the problem is anything that we would sell like sell through, we would have to like verify and make sure it's like legit. First of all, you know, there's transaction and labor and everything that would build in there. You know, it just, it doesn't really make sense for us to get involved. And then if it's brands we're not familiar with, how would we verify anything on it? And then if there's a problem with it, like we're somehow liable for it, you know? So it's like, you know, by the time we build all that in, you would be paying like full price for a pen anyway, for a used pen that somebody else, you know, kind of traded in or whatever. It would end up being kind of like a, buying a, a used car from a dealership. We would have to kind of like verify it and all that. And we'd have to not give you a lot of money for the pen you trade in and then, you know, try to sell it at as high a price as we can. It's just not the best use of our skills and certainly not the best way that we can serve. But, you know, there's certainly a, an opportunity out there to connect better around kind of that. So I don't know where that fits in, but I see that as an opportunity. Um, there's no like trade organization or group around pen manufacturing or nib tuning or pen repair or anything like that. You know, I think about like, you know, the, the I am path, you know, it's like the organization. I can't remember all the letters that that stands for, but you know, basically people that do calligraphy and handwriting and stuff like that. There's an organization for that to kind of pass along the trade of doing that and there's education and events that come around that. There's nothing on the, you know, and certainly if you're involved in, in, in other types of trades or manufacturing, you know, groups or whatever, there's often professional organizations that you can be involved in that can help certify, that can help train and have influence with manufacturers and stuff like that. Uh, you know, I don't know if anything like that ever existed in the pen world. I don't know deep enough about pen history to know if that was the case. So if any of you are like deep vintage pen nerds, like please, I would love to know about that kind of stuff. Um, if there was any like trade organization that certified Nibmeisters or something like that, I don't think that was the case. I think, you know, what's, what's kind of happened is that we're like, 
you know, basically companies were kind of isolated from each other. That's why you have so many different types of converters, like proprietary converters and cartridges is it was so like kind of entrepreneurial in terms of how products were developed and like there were patents that were put in place with all these different um, you know pen filling mechanisms and cartridge converter you know things that uh, there wasn't a lot of sharing that was kind of going from one manufacturer to another so I don't believe that there was ever any type of professional organization that was around you know manufacturing processes and stuff around pens because companies wanted to more or less keep that as trade secrets. Now, does it always have to be that way in the future moving forward? No, not necessarily. I don't know that companies would really look to open up with that, but it would be kind of interesting to see if anything like that could spring up. Not from like the larger ones like Pilot and Lamy and all that that are kind of like, they're really ingrained in their process and you know, sharing like that, like who's that really gonna benefit? Um, but I'm thinking like smaller manufacturers, you know, Edison, Herbert, um, you know, Jonathan Brooks, Canalea. I'm thinking like the ones, you know, Sean Newton, like those folks who are, who are really having to try to figure it all out from scratch. A lot of them end up kind of connecting with each other and sharing and all that kind of stuff. I think social media and the rise that has come up with that has given um, fertile soil to a lot of you know, just creators in general to be able to share knowledge with each other. And that's been really interesting to see specifically in like the photo video world. You know, I think about, um, there's an organization called the Rising Tide Society, who I like my sister-in-law is friends with the girl who founded that, girl, woman who founded that. And, um, and uh, that's a pretty cool organization that like looks to build community and collaboration with like freelance photographers and videographers and stuff like that. It would be cool to see something like that happen with like small time pen makers and, and stuff like that. I don't know what that would look like exactly, but that would be that would be pretty interesting to see what that what that could turn into. I don't know. Um, so that's kind of what I that's kind of what I have as top of mind there. So it's hard to say what the future is going to behold, um, but I think you know anything that can help benefit the pen community, anything that helps tie us closer together. Um, is only going to benefit uh, all of us, really. I believe in trying to share information. That's why I sit down every week and, and talk in front of a camera like this. Um, you know, obviously there's some trade secrets and stuff that, that have to stay close to the chest, but in the, in the grand scheme of things, you know, there's so much more information that's being shared right now at this point in history, um, you know, than, than just about any other time. So I think it's really cool that that's happening, and I encourage that in whatever way is, is feasible. All right, next question, Rita P on Facebook asks, uh, I love interesting nib designs. Sometimes a pretty nib can sell me on a pen. I'm with you. Uh, what are your favorite ornate or most uniquely designed nibs? Um, yes, so I have a bunch, and I don't know how much I'm gonna be able to show them in close detail. I'm going to try my best. Um, so starting out, I think Pelican's gold nibs are really good. Um, I like the two-tone ones. I don't have a two-tone one on hand at the moment, um, but I do have an M800 here. The M800 and M1000 specifically, the nibs are larger, but you know, it's got the Pelican bird on there and it's just got some nice kind of ornate um, kind of swirls in there that, I, that just complement the shape of the nib really well. Very thoughtful, very classic. Um, and I just like the way that Pelican does that. So Pelican is up there for me. Um, uh, Peniter is newer to the game, but their quill nib, I really like the design. It's a longer, kind of skinnier looking nib, and it's got these like notches cut out on the side, which notches cut out on a nib can look kind of unconventional and can look a little bit hacked, but this one just looks really nice, and they have some really nice kind of, um, you know, uh, what do you call it? intricate kind of, um, it's not really filigree, but you know, just some nice stuff kind of happening around the border and the, the keyhole. Um, you know, breather hole is, is really interesting. So I think they've done a really good job with that. Uh, let's see here, what else have I got? Mont Blanc, they have a lot of different nibs, um, especially on some of their limited editions and stuff. They really do a pretty good job with their nib designs. Uh, uh, but of course I have to give a nod to the 149, very iconic pen um, and the design. I'm a sucker for two-tone, um, you know, and this has got a nice, what's called gold out, which means that it's got a gold edge with like a two-tone on the inside, um, but very ornate, large nib. It just looks beautiful. And because especially because the pen is so kind of simple in its design, 
um, the nib really stands out and it just it draws your eye to the nib when you're holding the pen. So good job, Mont Blanc. 146 is nice too. And I, there's other ones like I have the Miles Davis pen. That's got a really cool looking nib, but the 149 is kind of classic and, and stands out. Um, Montegrappa's steel nibs, it's got kind of like this checkered pattern. Uh, I don't have it on me, but uh, you know, that one's got a really nice, uh, nice nib to it. Well, here's a, see I got a copper mule right here. Yeah, so this is, uh, this is one that's, this has got kind of a, like a gunmetal type of finish, but um, you know, it's got this nice kind of checkered pattern. I don't know how well you can see that with the sort of a matte finish that it has going on there, but that's a really nice design too. Not as ornate, uh, but I do like that one. What else? Uh, Namiki's larger nibs are really nice, especially, you know, the two-tone ones are like some of the fancier Pilot, like I have a Pilot Custom 845 Yurushi, and um, there's also the Pilot Custom Yurushi, which has an even bigger nib, but that one's got a nice two-tone as well, kind of like the Mont Blanc, it's got that gold out edge, um, but just, you know, nice big nibs, I like big nibs that have a lot of real estate to them. Uh, and then I am, again, kind of a sucker for two-tone. And then I like nibs with a nice pattern, lots of swirls and, and uh, interesting things going on. You know, just flourishes, I guess would be the right word for that. Flourishes. What else we got here? Um, you know, Visconti's nibs. Again, another two-tone. I'm really, I'm really am a sucker for two-tone. You know, I got the Homo sapiens. I carry that around a lot. But they're larger palladium nibs. Really nice, attractive nibs there. You know, it's got almost like a... Not a fleur de lis, but almost like that kind of design on it, which is really nice. Um, Lamy has some nice um, on their 14 carats. Of course, I like the I like the Lamy 2000. It's very simple, just kind of plain. But you know, they're they're 14 carat like kind of interchangeable nibs. This one is a Lamy Emporium. Something about the black and gold. It's just you don't see that a lot on a nib, and that one's kind of interesting. Of course, there are other 14 carat nibs that they have which is just the silver with the gold in the middle too, is also really nice. So I think those much simpler, different kind of shape, but I, I am jiving with that. Um, and then, you know, a couple interesting pens that I have that, that have uh, inlaid nibs. Just, you don't see a lot of inlaid nibs these days. Um, I have a Waterman Kareen, and then I have a um, Pilot Sterling. Both of these are inlaid nibs, different ones. This is the Waterman one. Uh, right over here that's got kind of this like Star Trek kind of looking inlaid nib to it. Um, and then the larger inlaid nib is the Pilot. And that one's really pretty cool. And then I forgot to grab a pen that I really, really love the nib. Um, one of my favorite, very kind of simplistic designs. Let me actually grab it out of my cabinet because I do love it a lot. Okay, so this one is very simple but it has one of the coolest designs, and a lot of you know what it is just by looking at it. It's the Pilot M90, and one of the coolest things about this particular nib is that it is built into the pen. It's a stainless steel pen in the nib. It's just so seamless, not ornate by any means, but just it's so clean looking, and the tipping and everything is built right into literally the body of the pen, and the feed too, just oh, the shape of that feed, just so clean and crisp. And it has kind of that like vintage modern look to it. You know what I mean? Sort of like a contemporary house from the 80s or 90s. You know, it has that classic modern look, if that, can, if that makes any sense. I don't know if that's the right terminology. Um, Sailor also has some really nice nibs. I don't know their nibs as well because I don't have a lot of experience with them, but they, all, they do a really good job with their nib designs too. So anyway, I could go on about all different types of nibs because I think... There's a lot of companies that do a really good job with nibs. Um, but I, I'm, I'm a fan of the two-tones. I'm a fan of the flourishes and larger nibs or just really interesting like inlaid stuff. Um, that that kind of hits me in the, in the right note. All right, last question for this week. Um, Dylan and Dylan and Illy. Dylan, Dylan Dilly, okay. <laughs> I don't know if I said that right, but you're on Instagram. You've been doing this for many years. What is the one thing that keeps you motivated and drive you to do such an awesome job? Well, first off, thank you for the implicit question that I am doing an awesome job. <laughs> I'm gonna take this as a very personal question. You know, I'm very proud of my team. Um, you know, obviously speaking for 40-ish people, there's a lot of different things that motivate them. Um, but, you know, I'm gonna speak just with this question to what personally 
motivates me. And I think maybe it'll resonate for some of you and give you a little insight into whatever the mind of me. So I could list a lot of things because frankly, I just love what I do. And even as hard and stressful as it can be sometimes, being a business owner, having kind of the responsibility that I have, putting myself out here on video a lot, um, you know, definitely the pros far outweigh the cons. There's a lot of there's a lot of things that I kind of think about when I think about why do I really why do I get motivated by do what I do, um, but by far the number one thing that motivates me to do what I do is a sense of calling or a sense of purpose towards this. And of course, that's like the the holy grail of having a job, right? Is like feeling like it's, you're meant to be doing it. Um, and I've worked before in jobs or like I've had things I've studied in school or internships I've taken or short-term jobs that I did where I was really trying and I worked really hard and I liked the work, but I just didn't feel like that is where I was ultimately meant to be. Um, but ever since I discovered the fountain pen, even like earlier when I was trying so hard to make pen making work in my early years, but even still, it was always like I was kind of spinning my wheels in the mud. And I thought it was where I was meant to be long term, but the data was telling me otherwise with just how successful I was able to make the business during those years. Once I kind of pivoted and Rachel and I started focusing on fountain pens, things really started to click into place and it was like, oh, this is what it's all been leading to. And then for the last nine years or so, it's been, wow, look at what can happen when things start to hit in the right way. Um, so that sense of purpose, like finding like, ah, that's why I had to do that for so many years, or that's what this experience was leading up to. And seeing it all fall into place doesn't mean that things have been easy or that I've known what to do every step of the way. Um, but, you know, it has been a really crazy series of events that kind of led me to where I am right now and led me into this business. Um, but I really do feel like I'm meant to be doing what I'm doing. Um, you know, so it's, it's kind of fitting that I'm getting this question right before the DC Penn show. It's kind of why I took this one, um, because this show in particular kind of marks that anniversary of recognizing the fountain pen community and just realizing like, man, there's really something to fountain pens here. I should really explore this. And it was that catalyst that really led me into all this. Um, so every year when the DC show comes up, uh, it really just kind of marks that period in my life where things just really started to change uh, for the better. Um, so it's, that said, you know, um, it's not always clear how I should be doing what I do. Uh, in fact, that's a lot of what I spend my time trying to figure out. Most of my life when I've had moments of clarity, it's been like, ah, this is the avenue I should pursue or this is the end goal of what should happen. But it's super like foggy and out there as far as the how the steps that should be taken to make that happen. And most, uh, and maybe it's because I'm like more on the visionary side than like the detail oriented side. Um, that's why I'm like so wildly inconsistent sometimes with the terminology I use or the way that I talk about certain things. It's because I'm way more big picture than details. Um, that's where Rachel balances me out quite a bit. Um, so with that said, I spend so much of my time, probably 90% of my time, figuring out how things should be done. Um, you know, uh, John Maxwell, um, author, has written like 80 something books, I don't know. Um, he has a concept that he calls the leadership lid. Okay, and uh, basically it's the idea is that an organization can only grow as much as the leaders who run it. And I feel that on a daily basis. <laughs> you know, if you're managing a team of two people and you can only grow those people and grow your team and have a, be as effective as you are growing yourself as a leader, or if you are on a team of 30 people and you are seeing that your manager is struggling and managing all of that, that's because there's a leadership lid. Your team can never be more successful than your leader's capability of running it. Um, I do kind of, kind of buy into that because I have a huge sense of responsibility for what goes on around here. Um, kind of a little bit more of 
satirical, <laughs> a little more tongue in cheek, is uh, something called the Peter Principle. If any of you are familiar with that, Lawrence J. Peter came up with this, this idea, um, which states that every employee is promoted to the highest level of his or her incompetence. Right? So the idea is you're doing a really good job at what you're doing, and then because you're doing well, you get given more opportunities or promoted into something, and then you don't know how to do that as well. And essentially, once you learn how to do that well, you're then promoted into something that you don't know how to do as well. Um, and the idea is that everybody eventually rises up to a place where they are no longer competent and no longer able to move up anymore. It's meant to be kind of a joke, but it's kind of taken hold a little bit in corporate or pop culture, whatever you want to call it, um, as this idea of, yeah, that person that person has petered out because they they no longer are capable of moving up and growing in their skills because they've just maxed out in their capabilities. So kind of funny, but you know, that is also somewhat true is what I've experienced in my own skills. Um, I feel like somewhat of a combination, not quite that bad, but it's somewhat of a combination of this idea of a leadership lid kind of Peter Principle thing of coming from just me and Rachel in our dining room growing this company you know, once I learn a skill or figure out a process, in order to continue to grow the organization, I then need to train it, delegate it away, figure out a process to automate it or whatever, and therefore I'm no longer doing it or I'm kind of overseeing or responsible for it, but I'm not, I'm not doing the things that I've mastered anymore. And I now have to take on something that's brand new and I have no idea what I'm doing or I have somewhat of an idea, but I have to learn the skills. So I spend the vast majority of my time basically trying to do something that I haven't do or gain a new skill or uh, do something where I feel largely incompetent. If I have to give the big secret, and I'm sorry for anybody on my team that thinks that there's like just some masterful wisdom that's bestowed upon you when you start a business, but it's usually actually quite the opposite. When you start a business and you realize taxes and HR stuff and all of the financials and runnings of a business and operations and shipping and t all this stuff, customer service, there's so many different things going on that it really opens up your eyes and you just feel completely overwhelmed and incompetent. That's why a lot of small businesses have a hard time even just gaining traction and figuring out a business to get off the ground at all. And then once you start getting into leadership and management and hiring and strategy and all this kind of stuff, it becomes so overwhelming and amazingly incompetent that a lot of people just struggle with that. And um, I think most small businesses, especially founder run companies, end up kind of struggling once they have five or 10 people on their team because you need leadership and you need to grow in some very drastic and very different ways than what prompted you to found the company in the first place that a lot of people struggle with that transition. And not to say that I have like knocked it out of the park, but I recognize from the very first team member that we were looking to bring on board that I was gonna have to completely shift the motivation that I had, the way that I recognized my own accomplishments and the security that I felt in the work that I was doing as soon as we were responsible for somebody else on our team. And that has only magnified with the more people that we've had on our team. And uh, so anyway, um, it's, it's unbelievably humbling. You know, you can look at having a team of 40 and saying, oh my gosh, that's incredible. But from, from my vantage point, um, the thing that keeps me motivated is the idea that there is more to learn every single day. I am, I am repeatedly humbled and just uh, brought with a mirror to my face of my own inadequacies daily. And I'm talking like on the hour, <laughs> I'm shown things that aren't working, problems that are happening, things that I have failed, people that are disappointed because of commitments that I made and broke, you name it, that is happening constantly because I'm not perfect yet, you know, at doing this thing and I'm trying to learn and get better every single day. Um, so that can be a crippling responsibility for a lot of people and it, it is very difficult to kind of wrap your head around and find motivation <laughs> in being faced with problems pretty much all the time. Um, but I don't know, I'm just kind of wired differently than a lot of people. I'm kind of motivated by that. And um, you know, that is something that I'm not crippled by. I'm not crippled by being faced with a lot of uncertainty or being faced with people that question what's going on because I see kind of what needs to happen and I have a, a good intuition and a good 
kind of work ethic and a trust in my own abilities to learn uh, things that I have never done before. Uh, and I don't let that slow me down from trying. Doesn't mean I always do it great, um, but usually I'm, I'm learning from every failure that I do. Sometimes, you know, it's like I've, I've read all kinds of business books and heard speeches and stuff like that. It's like, you know, I've heard about like football quarterbacks where they got to like rally the team and they're, hey, we're going to do this play and they throw an interception and the whole team is devastated, you know. And then the next play, the quarterback's got to rally up the team again. Okay, here's our play, whatever. And then boom, throws another interception. And the team is like so devastated and all that kind of stuff. And he's screwed up and done some bad stuff. And Next play, he's got to rally the team, have a plan, and go forth. And, just, and that's kind of like what it is in business. You have to, you know, you're going to fail. You're going to face things. You're going to let people down, uh, whether it's customers, vendors, your family members, your, you know, your own team, whatever it is, yourself, you know. But you got to pick up that ball again and throw the next play. That's really kind of what it all boils down to. So I kind of recognize as a leader and as a figurehead kind of of the company and, and to, in my own team and then to you all as well, um, that I have to really kind of be confident and secure in who I am and what it is that I'm doing, even if, you know, things are not 100% clear, I don't know that something is the absolute best decision, I got to try to make up the gap with my own intuition and willingness to make it right if something is to fail. So my kind of bow that I'm going to put on this question is my greater sense of calling towards kind of living this life because this life of a leader, this life of a business person, an entrepreneur, whatever you, however you want to package, whatever this thing is that I'm doing, um, you know, I feel called into doing that as crazy as it is and as hard and stressful as it can be sometimes, I know that I'm kind of wired for that. So that's what gives me my motivation every day. It's not money. It's not fame to whatever degree within the pen community. Those are all, there's some nice sides to that. There's some not nice sides to, to, to some aspects of it, just like there is for everybody. You know, if you're a beekeeper, there's going to be some amazing benefits to that that I will never see, um, you know, because I'm not a beekeeper there's also going to be some downsides. It's like that for everybody. The grass can always be greener, but it's if you have a sense of calling and purpose towards whatever it is you're doing, as humble or as glorifying as that thing may seem, um, that is going to be the best thing and the thing that's going to make you the happiest, is feeling like you're doing what you're meant to do. So there you go. There's my short answer. <laughs> then I'll wrap up Q&A nicely this week. My question of the week for this week is kind of coming off the question I had earlier here. Uh, what type of venue or social organization or whatever do you think that the fountain pen community could benefit from the most right now that maybe doesn't already exist or just needs to be developed more? I'd be really curious to get your feedback on that because I think it's a really interesting question. And then the writing prompt for this week, if you want to pick up your fountain pen and have a reason to write, if you have no other reason to write whatsoever, um, write about the oldest memory or earliest memory that you have as a child. So the first thing that you can remember, and it may get kind of cloudy because sometimes you see maybe a picture or a home video and you think you remember, but you really just remember seeing the picture of the video. Um, but uh, that's something that you can write down for yourself. I'm gonna say mine, it's gonna, make you, it's gonna make me sound like a crazy person, but I swear I have a memory that I don't, I don't even, it doesn't even make sense how I have this, but I think I have a memory from my first birthday. Okay, and I'll throw this out there. If you're a neuroscientist out there and you're like, Brian, that is literally impossible. You're a crazy person. Please let me know in the comments because I feel like I have this legitimate memory and I don't wanna lie to myself thinking that I remember something that I don't. But anyway, I have a memory of being held up in my mother's arms, looking down at my first birthday cake, which was a baseball glove with a baseball on top, which is really funny because I don't really care about sports at all these days. But that was my first birthday cake. She did not make that cake any other year. There's no other time where I would have been small enough for her to be holding me, <laughs> maybe my second birthday, but no, uh, that was the cake that she made for me for my first birthday. I remember having that memory really ever since kind of I was a kid. And then I, in the last five years or so, was talking with my mom about like, hey, I had this memory and she was like, how would you possibly remember that? You know, but I have no 
no uh, photographic or video evidence that would have been that specific perspective. Maybe I'm just making it up. I don't know, but that's my first memory. So I'll put that out there for you. Share in the deep dark sea. It's a Brian Goulet. I make up my first memories that I have as a kid. <laughs> But anyway, that's what I got. So, um, you know, I talked about a bunch of products here. I have most of these, some of these, not all of them, but a lot of them available on GouletPens.com. Um, thank you so much for liking, commenting, and subscribing. Be sure to engage with us. We love it. YouTube loves it because they like to show our videos more to people that uh, uh, the more engagement that we have. So please do that if you can. Um, and, uh, you know, I hope you have a great weekend, a great rest of your week. Enjoyed spending time with you and right on.